Hey everyone, today we're going to be chatting about power. I want to try and cover everything that you would need to know when it comes to the topic of power for building robots. Now, the principles in this video will apply to all different kinds of robots. In fact, all different kinds of electronics really. But since this is also part of a bigger series where we're going through how to build an autonomous mobile robot from start to finish, I'll be using that in all the examples throughout. If that project sounds interesting to you, check out the description. I'll include a link to the full playlist so you can watch that later. Today, we're gonna to be planning out the circuit on paper, making sure we understand everything. And then in the next video, I'll be wiring up the circuit and we'll be able to go through a bunch of the components in more detail. Make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss out on that. Let's start by reviewing some of the key concepts to understand about power. When we're talking about electricity and kind of how much of it there is, there are three terms we'll usually come across. Firstly, there's voltage, sometimes called potential difference, and that's measured in volts. Then we've got current, which is sometimes called amperage because we measure it in amperes or amps, or sometimes milliamps, which is a thousandth of an amp. And then thirdly, we've got power, which is sometimes called wattage because we measure it in watts or horsepower if it's a car. You can also see there in the table, I've got the common symbols that are used when we talk about these in equations. These three concepts can sometimes be a little bit tricky to understand and plenty of people have tried to explain it over the years. I'll try and find some videos and include a link in the description. But generally, they're gonna involve some sort of analogy with water pipes. The voltage in the battery is like pressure in a pressurized tank. There's potential there, but there's nothing flowing. If you connect that tank battery to pipe wires, then the pressure will force the water or the electricity to flow through the pipes. The amount of pressure and the size of the pipe, the resistance of the pipe, will affect how fast the water flows. Or something like that. The three things that are probably the most important to understand for now is firstly, that power equals voltage times current, or P equals VI. So if you've got more of voltage or current, then you've got more power, and if you've got less of it, you've got less power. If you keep the voltage the same, but you double the current, you've doubled how much power you're using. Or if you keep the current the same and halve the voltage, you halve the power. Secondly, for any particular application, the voltage is usually kept constant and the current will fluctuate up and down depending on what the load is. For example, until very recently, every single USB device out there ran at 5 volts. But they would all use different currents. So a wired keyboard might only use a few milliamps, but say you had something like a USB powered heater, that might pull a few amps. But no matter how many devices you're plugging in and unplugging, they're always going to be 5 volts. And thirdly, and this is probably the most important one to understand right now, when a power supply gives you a current or a power rating, that's the maximum amount of power that it can safely provide. And when a device or a component gives you a power or current rating, that's the maximum amount of power it will ever draw. So that last point is going to be key to many of the decisions we make as we're building our robot. When we start to exceed electrical ratings, things tend to stop working and get hot and in the worst case, catch fire. So when we're choosing our batteries, our components, our devices, our connectors and our wiring, we wanna make sure that everything is designed to work correctly together. Okay, so you wanna start wiring up a circuit for your robot. The first place to start is with the voltage. We have gotta figure out what voltage our robot is gonna operate. And in this case, we're actually gonna have two different voltages inside our robot. First up is going to be 5 volts. Many microcontrollers like the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino are based on a 5 volt input. And all of the USB devices we'll be using operate at 5 volts too. Sometimes you'll see 3.3 volt components crop up. We're not going to worry about that for now, um, but you should be aware that it's a thing. The question is though, where do we get 5 volts from? Maybe a battery? This is where we'll start to run into some problems. You see, 5 volt batteries just don't exist for chemistry reasons. And even if they did exist, the voltage would probably fluctuate depending on the charge and other factors. And these devices often require a very precise 5 volts. And the other thing is, we'll also need power for our motors. And generally, they're going to need a lot more than 5 volts. So the solution then is to use a regulator. This is a component that takes a different voltage, usually higher, sometimes lower, but almost always higher. And it converts it to a precise and regular output voltage, in this case 5 volts. And there are two main types of regulators out there. There's linear regulators and switching regulators. Linear regulators are simple, small and cheap. In fact, the Arduino and the motor driver board I'm using both include one on board just for the sake of convenience. The problem is 
that they're not very efficient, especially when you've got a high input voltage and if you're pulling a lot of current through it. And because of that, I'd recommend a switching regulator, sometimes called a switch mode power supply or a buck converter. We'll talk more about that pretty soon when we look at current. So what goes into our regulator? Well, that's our supply voltage. And so the next question is gonna be, well, what voltage should that be? The first step is to look at what other components we have that are gonna draw power. In this case, for me, it's gonna be my motors, which are two DC motors that get the supply voltage via a motor driver chip. So we want the supply voltage to be the right voltage for what our motors are rated for. Now, DC motors are pretty resilient. They'll pretty happily take voltage that's over or under what you want, but you have to check what your motors are capable of. 12 volts is usually a pretty safe bet. There are a lot of motors out there that are designed to work with 12 volts, but sometimes you might find six volts or 24 volts or something else. So it'll depend on what your project is. So that's how voltage is sorted out. 12 volts coming in, going to the motors and going to the regulator, which gives us five volts for the rest of our components. But what about current? Like I mentioned before, current is gonna dictate a lot of the decisions that we make when building our robot. We could go for a really small, efficient, low current robot, or we could go for broke, build a big, beefy robot with massive motors that pull heaps of current. Whatever we're doing, we just wanna make sure we're being careful and aware as we design it. Let's start by focusing on our five volt components again. We wanna make a list of all the components our robot's gonna have and try to get a rough estimate for the maximum current they can each draw. Now, for some components, it might be hard to find a data sheet. This can be a bit difficult. We just need to make do with what we can. Here you can see my estimates, but don't trust these. Make sure you do your own calculations. You can see the total is 4.7 amps, which I'll just round up to five. You can also see that most of this comes from a few heavy hitters, the Pi, the LiDAR, the depth camera, and the LCD screen. So if you don't have some of those components, then your current draw is gonna be a lot lower. Once we know how much current our five volt components are gonna draw, up to five amps in this case, we need to make sure we choose a regulator that's capable of supplying this. Even though the regulator is only forwarding on power that's come from another source, there's still a limit to how much it can safely pass through. So our regulator needs to be capable of supplying 25 watts of power. I'll be using this 25 watt regulator and we'll take a closer look at it in the next video when we assemble everything. So now we can kind of treat this whole part of the circuit as one big 25 watt component. And if we're trying to pull 25 watts of power out of the regulator, we need to make sure we're putting 25 watts of power into it. Now, if we're drawing exactly five amps at five volts out and the regulator was 100% efficient and our power supply was exactly 12 volts going in, then we can calculate that the current draw from our power supply would be 2.083 amps. In reality though, there's always gonna be efficiency losses and we won't always have exactly 12 volts since our battery can fluctuate. So I'm gonna round this number up to 2.5 amps to use for future calculations. So that's our five volt components. What about our motors? The motor current draw is gonna be really dependent on the sort of motors you've chosen and what your robot's like, how heavy it is, how hard the motors have to work, that sort of thing. And that's because the more torque that a motor has to put out, the more current that it's gonna draw. Now, the maximum amount of current that it's gonna draw is when you stall the motor. So that's like if this motor was spinning around right now and I just grabbed the output shaft and held it still and just let the power run through it, that current running through is called the stall current. And if you let that much current run through your motor for more than a moment, it's probably gonna wreck it. So we don't wanna go anywhere near that. To find out what the stall current is without breaking your motor, we wanna take a look at the data sheet. It should tell you the stall current and probably also some other currents at lower torques that you should be using. So you can see here the motor that I plan to use has a stall current of 1.8 amps and a rated current load of 0.75 amps. And remember that we've got two motors, so the total current draw from our supply is gonna be two times that. So in this case, the maximum amount of current that I'll be pulling from my 12 volt supply is 3.6 amps. You also wanna make sure that your motor driver is capable of supplying that much current to the motors. Uh, we'll cover that in a couple of videos when we get our motors up and going. So the maximum amount of current required from our 12 volt power supply is gonna be 6.1 amps. And since this is a mobile robot, that power is almost certainly gonna be coming from a battery. So how do we figure out what kind of battery we use? So if we're looking for a battery that can supply about 12 volts and at least six amps of current, 
then our most likely candidate is going to be a LiPo battery. If you're not familiar with LiPos, I'll try and find a good video to include in the description. There are five things though that it's worth knowing about our battery. First up is a warning. LiPo batteries pack a lot of power and energy into a pretty small package, which is great for powering a robot, but also poses a safety risk. Whenever you're working with LiPos, you want to be careful. Don't let the charge get too low. Don't let the wires short on anything. Make sure you charge them with a proper charger in a fireproof area with the balance leads in under supervision. Store them safely, etc. Secondly is the S number. This is the number of cells in the battery. See, the battery you buy is actually a bunch of smaller cells joined together. So this battery says 3S on it. That means it's three cells joined together to get a higher voltage. Speaking of voltage, each cell of a LiPo has a nominal voltage of 3.7 volts. So our three cell battery is going to have a total of 11.1 volts. But LiPos actually vary a lot in their voltage depending on how charged they are. So when they're fully charged, each cell is going to have 4.2 volts, so that's 12.6 total for our three cell battery. And then the voltage is going to drop down as we use the battery. Now, if you let it get too low, it can be bad for the battery or even dangerous. So I don't like to let mine get below 10 volts. Uh, make sure you're checking the voltage regularly. And also, if anyone knows of a good, cheap, simple, uh, adjustable, low voltage cutoff unit for use in small robots like this, let me know, because I'd like to include it. The next number to look at on our battery is the capacity. This is usually measured in milliamp hours. That's how much current you could continuously draw from the battery to go from full to empty in exactly an hour. And if you're pulling more current, it'll last less time. So this 3000 milliamp hour battery could run at six amps or 6000 milliamps for half an hour, or 30 minutes. But you don't wanna run it the whole way down. You wanna to aim to maybe use two thirds of that and like I said before, keeping an eye on the voltage as you go. Finally, the discharge rating, or the C number, tells you the maximum current that can be drawn from the battery. But this number is a bit weird. The way you calculate it is you multiply the capacity of the battery by the C number. So this battery is 3000 milliamp hours and 20 C, so that's 60,000 milliamps or 60 amps which is plenty. That's like 10 times more than the six amps that I calculated I'll need. Now, if you want, you can be doing all of your testing using a battery, but you'll pretty quickly get tired of having to charge it all the time. So that's why I recommend, while you're doing bench testing, to have some kind of mains powered power supply. Now, the best option is probably to get a proper bench power supply like this one here. Um, they're not too expensive and they let you adjust the voltage and the maximum current to whatever you need. Um, I should probably get around to getting one for myself. But if you can't afford that, there are plenty of other choices out there. You can get dedicated high current 12 volt supplies. Uh, you can use a computer power supply. You could probably use a normal AC to DC wall wart, but make sure that you check that the current and voltage are correct first. Um, or if you got really stuck, you could even use something like a car battery. Even though it's still only a battery, it's gonna drain a lot slower than one of these will. That's all the main components of our circuit covered, but there are a few other parts of our circuit infrastructure that we wanna make sure we talk about before we're done. Don't switch off now because these are some of the most important parts for safety. Something to make sure we don't forget is our wiring and our connectors. We have to make sure that they are all rated for the currents that we're using. And I say current because the voltage doesn't matter, it's all about the current when it comes to this. So I'll include a link in the description to a table where you can see for a particular gauge, a particular thickness of wire, how much current that wire can safely carry. And for connectors, you wanna be checking their data sheets. For example, this XT60 connector is rated for 60 amps, but this RCY plug is only rated for five amps. And breadboards and jumper wires should only be used for very low currents in the milliamps. Related to this is something I mentioned in the last video, which is that the Raspberry Pi has a limit on how much current can pass through the USB ports that are on board. And so that's why I'll also be including an external USB hub so we can supply extra power to this and get all the current we need to our devices. Once we've got safe wiring and connectors, we wanna make sure we add a power switch to our robot. This lets us turn it off when we're not using it so that we can safely disconnect and connect the battery without risk of shorting things out. And the last thing we need to add to our circuit diagram is a fuse. Without a fuse, if positive gets connected to negative somewhere in the circuit, maybe there's a loose wire or a failure in a component, 
It creates what's called a short circuit and a huge amount of current will flow from the battery through all the wiring. It'll basically use as much power as it possibly can and burn out the wiring or worse, set the battery on fire. That's generally regarded as something to avoid. So by adding a fuse, we're creating a deliberate failure point in our circuit. If the current gets too high, it'll burn out the fuse, break the short circuit and keep us safe. We don't want it to burn out under normal use though, so we need to make sure we choose a fuse that is rated for the current that we have in our circuit. And that way it'll let through current up to that point and then burn out if the current is going beyond that. Now keep in mind that this fuse is designed just to protect the wiring and the battery. It won't necessarily protect your components from short circuits. Uh, there are fuses that we can install for that, but we're not gonna talk about that right now. And remember, just like with everything else, in the next video, I'll be showing you the fuse that I'm using in my circuit. So I think that'll do it for the theory side of things. In the next video, I'll be wiring everything up and we'll be able to take a closer look at some of the components. Make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss out on that. Now, I've tried to cover everything that I can, but I'm sure there are things that you think I should have mentioned and you'll let me know in the comments. But if there's anything particularly relevant to safety, please leave a comment letting me know so that I can update the description. And if you're really quick, I'll try to get it into the next video. Otherwise, I'll catch you next time.